boundary between the sensory and the supersensory worlds. To understand the relationship between the different worlds, we must understand that a force that has to develop its activity according to cosmic order in one world can, when it unfolds in another world, direct its activity against this cosmic order. This is why two opposing powers must be present in the human etheric body, the capacity to transform oneself into other beings and the strong eye feeling or sense of self. In the physical sensory world, these powers in the human soul can be developed only when that life is muted. In the elemental world, however, they balance one another, thereby making human nature possible, just as in the physical world sleeping and waking make human life possible. The relationship between two such counteracting forces could never be such that they extinguish one another. Rather, their relationship must be one in which each is developed and acts to balance the other. I feeling and the capacity to transform oneself into another work on each other in this way only in the elemental world. In the sensory world, only the results of the mutual relationship and interaction of these two forces can be effective within the cosmic order. For, if the capacity for transformation, which the etheric body must have, were active in the sensory world, one would feel something in one's soul that did not conform to the physical body. The physical body stamps us firmly in the sensory world. It places us within it as particular personal beings. But the etheric body does not place us in the elemental world in the same way. In order to be a complete human being in the elemental world, a person must be able to take on the most varied forms. Were we unable to do so, we would be condemned there to complete isolation. We could know only ourselves. We would feel unrelated to any other beings or processes. It would be as though in that world no other beings or processes existed. On the other hand, if we develop in the sensory world the same capacity for transformation that we need for the elemental world, then personal identity would be lost. We would live in contradiction with ourselves. In the physical world, this capacity for transformation must remain a force at rest in the depths of the soul. A force that gives the soul its basic mood, but one that does not develop in the sensory world. Supersensory consciousness must acquire the capacity for transformation. Were it unable to do so, it could not observe in the elemental world. Suprasensory consciousness thus acquires a capacity that it can use only while active in the elemental world and that it must suppress as soon as it returns to the sensory world. Suprasensory consciousness must therefore always be aware of the boundary between these two worlds. It must not work in the sensory world with capacities that are appropriate only to the suprasensory world. If the soul, knowing it is in the sensory world, were consciously to allow the etheric body's capacity for transformation to continue its activity there, then normal consciousness would be filled with thoughts that do not correspond to sensory reality. The soul's thought life would become confused. Awareness of the boundary between the worlds is a necessary precondition for the proper activity of supersensory consciousness. Those who wish to achieve suprasensory consciousness must take care that knowledge of the suprasensory worlds does not creep in to disturb ordinary consciousness. By meeting the guardian of the threshold, one gains an understanding of the soul's situation in the sensory world. The meeting shows whether one's soul is sufficiently strong to banish from physical consciousness the suprasensory forces and capacities that should not be active in it. If one enters the supersensory worlds without the self-knowledge provided by the guardian of the threshold, the experiences of those worlds can be overwhelming. They can force themselves into physical sensory consciousness in the form of illusory images. 
These images, then, take on characteristics from the sensory world, with the result that the soul wrongly considers them to be reality. However developed clairvoyance would never consider let me read that again, however, developed clairvoyance would never consider images of the elemental world to be real, in the same sense that physical consciousness must consider experiences in the sensory world to be real. Only the soul's capacity for transformation brings the images of the elemental world into the right relationship with their proper corresponding reality. Neither should the second necessary force in the etheric body, the strong I feeling, enter the soul's life in the sensory world in the way that would be appropriate in the elemental world. Were that to happen, it would be the source of immoral inclinations in the sensory world, at least to the extent that such tendencies are connected with egoism. Observing the cosmos, therefore, spiritual science sees in egoism the origin of evil in human activity. One would misunderstand the cosmic order if one were to believe that this order could exist without the forces that form that source of evil. If these powers were not present, the etheric human being could not develop in the elemental world. Indeed, so long as they operate only in the elemental world, such forces are thoroughly good. They cause evil only when they do not remain in the depths of the soul, where they can regulate the relationship of the human being to the elemental world. When these forces are displaced into the soul's experiences in the sensory world, they transform themselves into egoistic impulses. They then act counter to the capacity to love and become the origin of immoral activity. The movement of strong eye feeling from the etheric body into the physical body not only strengthens egoism, but also causes the etheric body to weaken. Suprasensory consciousness discovers that as egoism becomes stronger in sensory experience, eye feeling becomes weaker in the suprasensory world. In the depths of our souls we are not strengthened, but weakened by egoism. And when we step through the gates of death, the egoism that we develop in the life between birth and death weakens the soul for experiences in the suprasensory world.